it really takes, on average, a year and a half for people to have success if they have the right budget, the right team, and the know-how to do this, right? So if you don't have any of that, it takes even longer. And I think that if people were overnight successes, they would completely self-destruct. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. This is No Labels. And as you know, we love to bring out people who represent No Labels necessary lifestyle and this is none other than wendy day hey i am so What's happy up? to be here i love what you guys are doing oh Thank man you. i appreciate, appreciate that appreciate, yeah. appreciate that wendy is wendy is one of the goats in terms of my eyes and how i look at it in terms of just how you move in this space we know the history uh well for those who don't know the, the cash money the master p deals the things that you've done um, with people like eminem and then even all the way to like continuing to what's the word uh adapt to the new industry and yeah. still helping break artists yeah. I, I don't know i remember this, this I forget, i'm not looking thinking about Lil donald which is another artist but it was another artist uh um, trouble trouble yes trouble. that's what i was yeah. thinking about saying so people who can span generations and still figure out how to be relevant and then somebody who can do it on the outside of the industry in a way right mm-hmm. that's really difficult yeah is because i know that yeah. technically you know, we straddle and play the outside game. And I'm like, man, you were doing that back then. And then you managed I've to continue I've always to been doing that. Yes. Right. That's, that's a very, yeah. cause like position. all the deals that I did, we put the music out independently first mm. and built the leverage and got them to the point where they could get the multi-million dollar deals. Mm. Can you throw a couple of those numbers out there just for people who don't know, <laughs> just, just stun on them a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, you said, you like know, the those, $30 million the, cash money deal. Yeah. Just, you know, just so people understand the troubles, $8 million deal. Yeah, just the, the gravity of, of, of a windy day, the, yeah. the, the likes of windy day. And I think we, we build millionaires. That is a hell that's of the a goal. sales pitch. Yeah, yeah that's the that goal. Is a hell of a sales pitch. Yeah. Can you sign me or, or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> the great thing is, I don't need to sign you. You can do this yourself. Mm, even you better. can do this yourself. Even better. Yes. Man. You can keep the ownership and you can keep the control. So that's a perfect um, segue to what do what's the biggest misconception about what you actually do um i think the biggest misconception is that i have a magic wand or some special fairy dust and i can just sprinkle it on people and they don't have to do any work and they'll be famous when they wake up and that's not the case um it's a lot of work it takes money it takes motivation it takes work ethic it takes great music and it takes caring, like really mm. wanting to win and wanting to excel. Right. It's not, this is not something somebody can do for you. I can't just hand it to somebody. I wish I could, mm. but I can't. Actually, no, I don't wish I could. I, I love that people have to work for this. Because when you work for it and you succeed and you start to make money, the money has more value because you saw what it took. It wasn't just like winning the lottery and all of a sudden you wake up and you're wealthy one day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to actually put in the work and you learn to appreciate it. You know, it it really takes on average a year and a half for people to have success if they have the right budget, the right team and the know how to do this. Right. So if you don't have any of that, it takes even longer. And I think that if people were overnight successes, they would completely self-destruct. Mm. Mm. What what is that that one to have your number come from? Are we talking about from artists like complete ground zero into yeah successful career? Yeah, and that's if they have everything and a little bit of luck, like everything going for them, the right budget, the right team, the know how, everything aligns, the great music that fans like consume ravenously. Yeah, like best case scenario. Well, just for clarity too, right? Zero, and then you say a year and a half to. You know, the terms like break, like break or even, like up, break even, break even. Yeah. Let's say right, break even. Yeah. Let's not even say blow up okay. because th- when you break even, you, you will have a buzz. People mm-hmm. will know who you are, but it takes a while to break even. 
right? The, mm-hmm. the, the numbers and the income you're making income from shows, from streaming, from merchandise. Do you guys have merch for your podcast? We're, we're working on it. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah. I will buy it and wear it on my podcast. I, I, so we would appreciate it. I would be happy to do that. Like I'd love to support you. So it's really important to monetize early because the people that love you will support you. Mm-hmm. So, so you do believe in monetizing Stroud together? Do you think there's a point where it makes sense for the artists to even start thinking about it? I, I think you monetize from day one, but, and it's a huge but, big but, you don't, you don't focus on the money because there's a lot of stuff you're going to have to do for free. Mm. And if you, if you focus only on the money when it's time to like do free shows and um, show up to events and you're not getting paid yet. If you focus only on the money, you're going to kind of screw yourself out of an opportunity to promote and meet people and build your buzz. Yeah. And that's so important. That's so key. People want to connect with you as an artist, right? Like people just want to feel the connection and the internet is amazing. Like we live at an amazing time in, in, in life, but it's not enough. You actually have to go out and meet and greet and interact with people like a politician, right? Yeah. People really want to feel your vibe and you can't necessarily feel somebody's vibe through a screen. I mean, you, you kind of can, but not really. So that whole real world aspect is as important, I think, as your persona online and your story. And I think it's really important to show people who you are. And if you're focused only on the money and you're like, okay, I'm not leaving my house for under 50 bucks or for under 500 or for under 5,000 or whatever, you know, whatever uh, monetary value you put on yourself, you could be really doing yourself a disservice. So I want people to monetize, but I don't want them to focus just on the money. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes sense. So like when you talk about this team that needs to be in place or that would be nice if you had it. It would be nice. It's not mandatory. It's not mandatory. Yeah, Keep going. What would that look like? Definitely people that are committed to you, like people that want to be down and, and in your world. Um, But they also have to have some degree of business sense. Like they can't be somebody that scares off other people Mm. they can't be somebody that doesn't know what they're doing they can't be somebody that's too aggressive so it's got to be somebody that can do business somebody that can talk somebody that can follow up somebody that is somewhat non-threatening so that you know people aren't afraid to approach (laughs) you as an artist or afraid to do business with you um you've seen those scenarios before Chug knight yeah (laughs) yeah i mean but he was arguably successful right terribly successful yes very successful but he also used to scare away a lot of business there were a lot of people that were afraid to do business with death row in the early days because they were afraid of suge and his connections and suge really wasn't scary like if you did the right thing and you came respectfully there was really nothing wrong with Suge. Suge really was only a problem if you brought the drama or you were trying to take advantage mm. of the artist or you were disrespectful. Or Did you ever like work with him personally? Yes. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. I was, I was close to Death Row. I was close to Death Row and Bad Boy because at one point they were really running the industry. And then... I befriended Tupac. So I was working with Tupac when he passed away. I befriended him when he went to to prison. And I was shopping his deal when he was leaving death row so that he could start his own label. And that whole camp were, were my friends. Like I was very close to B man and Kevin black, you know, shout out to the people that worked at, at death row because they really, were the reason that label was so successful. Mm. They really worked hard. Mm. You mentioned Tupac mm-hmm. and like he was such a unique character, right? Very special. Um and I I remember even that you didn't necessarily like him at first. I didn't. Right? Yeah. What did he was loud, <laughs> obnoxious. <laughs> I used to avoid him. 
It's you're, really funny now, you're right? You're pretty loud yourself, though. I am, <laughs> but I was never, I am loud. This is true. But I was never, like, messy oh, or okay. um, obnoxious mm-hmm. with it. Yeah, yeah. So what it like at when you summarize it as someone who got to see it more and like was more on the business side of, of like working with him too yeah what do you think was special about him from the in terms of like the his mindset yeah. yeah the way he thought was amazing because he had been raised by black panthers you mm-hmm. know so he was extremely pro black and cared very much about people of color Mm. At a time when a lot of other people were in straight pimp mode, like get money, get money, get money, you mm. know, and he wanted to to do better and he wanted to make a living, but he wasn't willing to sell out to do that. And I think that's what made him so unique, like his philosophy from day one was to help people. And that's what that's what connected me to him, like in, in the business plan that we put together for his label, which was called Euthanasia, there was um, there was daycare centers in, in, in the office. There was a daycare center in the office. In the plan for the community centers, there was medical and daycare centers. So he really cared about people being able to live comfortably and fulfill their basic needs so that they could get to that next level and excel. Because when you're focused on the struggle and you're focused on having to feed yourself and clothe yourself, you can't do all that extra shit because your mind is too focused on survival, right? And you're always in fight or flight mode. But once your basic needs are taken care of, you can really like start to do other stuff and focus on okay how can i make a difference how can i you know how can i make my life matter what's my legacy there's like other stuff you can really think about and get to and and that's what i loved most about him was he really cared it was genuine mm. you <laughs> do you that's it's funny you say that the genuine that really got me cuz i've Authentic. seen i've seen multiple scenarios where artists pretend to care about things like that. Right. Right. And it's very opportunistic. Yes. And it gives you a I've real worked bad, with a few of those. <laughs> it gives you a real bad taste in your mouth, right? It does. Um and because you, know. you really don't know. Like you can't right. tell up front like who's full of shit and who's real. Right. So it's like the proof is in the pudding. Like once the money starts to come in and you see what people focus on when they have money, it kind of tells you where they're at. Where yeah. their mind is at. Or let's let's use this to get attention for a record. Yes. And I don't really care about the yes. thing. Yes. Yeah. We've we've had some of those and seen those. Yeah. And that's I always try to tell people too, doing that actually usually isn't gonna get you the result that you want anyway. Like right. if, if it's like a bad track or if you're having trouble getting attention, you can't just attach it to I don't know, a social movement and then right. think all of a sudden it's going to blow up. No, that's the part that makes it no, worse. You it becomes a gimmick. It becomes a gimmick. Yeah. Right. And and, and after a while, people can tell what's real and what's not. Mm-hmm. And if you come up on a platform that you stand for and then somebody sees you doing the opposite, it's like, whoa, what are you doing? You know, mm-hmm. it it can hurt you more than help you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bandwagon jumping is never a, a good marketing plan. <laughs> Hey, well, uh, a lot of artists I feel like need to hear that. Um, yeah. Because we, and I understand the need to grow and try to take advantage of trends and things like that. And you don't you don't think too bad of it when it's like a, a regular trend, but when it starts to become like social leaning, it just gets real weird. Like, hey, man. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's kind of like the beginning of selling out in my, in my own opinion. But, exactly. Um, We're sitting here on the anniversary of George Floyd and how many people jumped on that bandwagon when it happened. Right. Yeah. You know, it was it was just crazy. Like people were like, oh, that's the movement. Let's jump on it. And they didn't stop to think that, OK, when this is no longer in the news, where are you where, where are you going to stand? Like, where are you at? What mm-hmm. have you done? You know, what what difference have you made? Yeah. And then people, like we're in that era where people will, you know, juxtapose you here and then whatever your next actions are, <laughs> it will come right back at you. It will. 
It will. Yeah. So some artists and managers are just waiting for lucky moments when the ones who are killing it have systems to consistently take artists to another level over and over again. And if you want to see what that looks like, we just did a collab where we not only show the system that we use that's resulted in billboard hits, some of the biggest viral moments on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, but also we got J.R. McKee to break down how he took an artist from zero to one of the biggest hit songs of 2022 and getting a Grammy in January of 2023. This is recent stuff, not old tactics. If you want to check it out, go to www dot brandmannetwork.com slash Grammy. Don't forget the WWW or it won't work because JR gets into the details of looking at the data, decisions that got made, how much content got created and how they adjusted the content over time for different parts of the campaign. This is real behind the curtains type of stuff. So again, go to www.brandmannetwork.com slash Grammy. If you want to check this out and apply it to yourself, back to the video. Like along the lines of staying on the outside of the industry, two questions. One, why is that? And two, how do you do that for so long? Um, why is that? Because I didn't like how the industry functioned. Um, I'm saying this in the past tense, but it's even sort of in the present tense. Like the artists are always the last to get paid. And I came into hip hop because I love the music and the energy of the music and the stories in the music. And then I learned to, um, from hearing the music, I learned to um, get to know the people making the music. And I understood the struggle, still do. And I had a problem with people that were making money from hip hop but not giving back to the culture or not caring about the culture. And it just seemed extremely opportunistic to me and it personally offended me greatly. So I started Rap Coalition in 1992 to pull artists out of bad deals. And you can't be pulling somebody off of a label and be part of the label system. You can't be part of the problem and saying, wow, this problem really sucks, but let me catch a paycheck. Let me be in the middle of it and make money from the people that are opportunistically taking advantage of artists. And that's not to say that everybody in the industry does that. They don't. There are just a few bad actors that have taken advantage of artists unfairly. Mm. And I have a problem with that. And I've always had a problem with that. So I never wanted to become part of that inner circle because then I wouldn't be objective. I wouldn't be able to step to the people that were taking advantage and say, hey, stop doing that. And I wouldn't necessarily be an advocate for artists if I was sleeping with the enemy, you know? Mm. So that's why I never became part of it. I also never understood the business model where money had more value than the art or the art form. So in the equation, there's somebody that makes music and there's somebody that puts up money and takes a risk, right? Yep. Well, the person taking the risk is seen as more valuable than the art, than the music itself. And I have a problem with that because a rapper signing to a label is taking just as much risk that these people will know what to do for their career and get them to the next level as the money is taking on the artist and hoping the artist won't self-destruct along the way or will make um, music that fans will want to hear, right? But for some reason, the money has more value in society, so the money gets to set the rules. So when somebody signs an artist, they're signing them for, I don't know, whatever, however much money they're going to advance them and put into the marketing budget, but they're getting their money back first mm -hmm. and they're taking it from the artist's small percentage. So an artist might sign to a label and be getting 15 to 18% of the income but the money that's paying back what's spent, let's just say it's a million dollars so I can make my, my point, right? Out of their 15% of that income, they're paying back the million dollar budget. Mm -hmm. It's not coming off the top, which is really 
technically what it should be. Yeah. The money should come off the top and then they should split whatever the agreement was. And and I, I, I do believe that you get what you negotiate. So if you negotiate and accept 15 to 18%, that's what you're going to get. If you negotiate and accept 50%, that's what you're going to get. But in order to get more, you have to have more going on. You have to have more leverage, yeah. right? So that's why I started helping artists put out their music and build a buzz and start making money independently because when you get when when you have money coming in and somebody offers you money their money doesn't have as much value because you're already making your own yep you know i'm going to use la russell as an example so let's say la russell's making a hundred thousand a month if a label comes along and this is actually a true story if a label comes along and offers him two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and he can make that in two and a half months but they want him to sign for five years for that advance it's crazy he'd be insane to do that deal yeah you know so if a label sees what he's doing and they want to be in business with him, they're going to have to step up their offer and they're going to have to come a little more correct. Yeah. And the great thing about coming more correct is the more money somebody has to put into working with him, the bigger the risk on their part. And if they take enough of a risk, they're not going to lose. They're going to make sure that he wins. And that's the value in having a partner that's all in and committed mm -hmm. because they're going to make sure it's kind of like if I borrowed 20 bucks from you and I didn't pay you back, you'd probably never lend me money again, but it probably wouldn't change your life if you yeah. lost 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. But if you invested $3 million in me and I, weren't making your money back and I couldn't pay you back, I bet you'd figure out ways for us to make money so you could get your damn money back. That's the value of leverage. If you're all in, you're going to figure out a way to make your money back. You're not going to give up very easily. You're going to say, okay, that didn't work. Let's try this. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try this. You're going to keep plugging away until you get your money back. If you have a little bit of money in and the artist doesn't pop immediately, you might say, next. So for me, I like the deals that are a little bit bigger and a little bit more highly leveraged because I think they have a better shot of winning. And that's why I always did bigger deals. Yeah. That's funny that you say that. It reminds me of, you know, as controversial as he may be, uh, Grant Cardone. You know who that is? Mm -hmm. I remember he said when he <laughs> the recession happened and he realized you know, that he didn't owe the bank enough. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Said, oh, I only owe them a few million dollars or whatever. Look at Trump. And now they're coming at me trying to hit me. But yes. if I owe them a billion dollars, they would be trying to be like, hey, they would be like, hey, we have this opportunity for yeah, you. Why don't you come and partner with us? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, that's the exact same concept. It is. It's, it's, it's interesting, but it does make all the sense. It in makes the world. all the sense in the but, world. Um, when you look at the artists that I've helped, they've all been in the top five or the top 10 mm. of success. And that's why, mm. because they were always in a position, first of all, where they could do it themselves. We put out music independently so they know how to do it. They don't wait for the label to feed them. They go and feed themselves. Right. But they are also so highly leveraged in these deals that the label's like, Oh, you're going to win. Oh, you're going into the top 10 because yeah. we're going to get our money back. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of like that. Yeah. No, and then not. what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Well, you asked. It was how do you survive and move being independent so long, I, staying outside I, the industry? I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 a little bit of luck. I'm not driven by accolades and I'm not driven by people's opinion or perception of me. I kind of. I kind of put my blinders on and just work. In fact, I'm, I'm more, this is kind of sad to say, but I focus more on my misses and my losses than my wins and my successes. So it's always funny to me when people say to me, oh, you're so successful. Cause in my head, I'm thinking of all the things that I tried to do and, and they didn't win. Mm. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I did a couple things that were great, but look at all these things that I tried that didn't come into fruition yet, you know? Yeah. And and I tend to focus more on that. So maybe that's why. I, I, I don't know that I can answer that. Mm. I mean, 
it's interesting because a lot of times people come to people because of they have a label attached to them, right? Right. On the, on the executive if side. If they don't know. Right? Yeah. If, they're, if been, they don't know how this works, of right. course they do. You're next to an artist because you are managing them and oh, I'm going to come to you because of that. Or you're at a label. I'm going to come to you because of that. But you not doing those things, somehow people still find you, which means you, you definitely have to have good word of mouth. You know what it's kind of like? And this is a really fucked up example, but it's sort of like. If I have a, a, a girlfriend who's dating a guy and he's wealthy and he's handsome and he's popular, but he's beating the shit out of her at night when they're alone. I'm not going to look at that situation and say, gee, I wish he was mine because I don't care that he's handsome and wealthy and and popular if 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 he, if that's the price if getting beaten is the price. Right. right. And I kind of look at at major labels that way. If. If an artist has to be broke and not make money, and how many people have you seen on social media that have said, yeah, I was signed for three years, I put out five albums, and I never made money but show money. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you want to do that if you knew? Well, I know. I know that's the path. I know that's what happens if you go there without leverage. So I I never saw that as the win, as as success. So I, it's not like, it's not like I couldn't get into a label. It's that I didn't want to get into a label. Yeah. I never saw the benefit of that. I wasn't doing it because I wanted a paycheck or I wanted accolades. I was doing it because I wanted the artist to win. And that to this day, 31 years later, that's what drives me. I want the artist to win. And I also surround myself with younger people. You know, a lot of people in my generation say, oh, new rap sucks. Hip hop is dead. Mumble rap, blah, blah, blah. I've never said that. I've been listening to hip hop since 1980 because I'm old, right? I used to ride my dinosaur and and listen to (laughs) hip hop. But I watched it change and grow like every five years or so. So I came up in this knowing that it's ever changing. So I don't look at the nineties and say, Oh, that was the golden era. This is when it mattered. Everything else sucks. No, I started listening to rap in the eighties. So I listened from 80, 80 to 87. And then the music changed and went from being, you know, black nationalism to pop and bottles. And then it went from pop and bottles to, you know, talking about the internet, talking about, um, uh, uh, perks and, you know, whatever, I've seen it change and grow and I know that it's going to keep changing and growing, you know, tired of drill rap. It's okay. Wait a year. You know, it's just, it's Mm. just how this is. So I, I think because I know that and realized it early on, if there was a phase that I didn't like, like I didn't like horror core when that came out in the nineties and the early nineties, I thought that was so stupid, but it was gone as quickly as it came. So it's, it's ever evolving and it's ever growing and I love it for what it is. And I love it for the fact that there are people making a living doing this, you know, and a lot of the people that are making a living, this is the only way they're going to make a living, you know? Yeah. And I love that. And I love that the labels have to listen to young black people, young Latino people and give them a voice and invest in them. I think that's awesome. Like where else does that really happen? Mm. Yeah. In most businesses and most economies, you, as you grow and get older, you become more successful. This is a business where you can be 18 or 21 or 24 and be a multi fucking millionaire Mm. and run an empire. And it gets harder as you get older. Yes. Which is the, it's the opposite, the right? Twenty two of it all. Yes. What you mentioned the deal earlier that artists make that can be very bad when you go to the major label, and the major labels are looked at as the people who are the more valuable or the investor in general. Right. I understand your. Or they your, were. I understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I understand your argument. What do you say to the investor though, who says, "Hey, I put my money into this situation." Yes, and if I love the money. Doesn't get made back. 
the artist can walk away and I just don't get I don't get my money because it's well, not like they have to file for it, bankruptcy. It, it, or anything It's true. Like that, it's right? true. The artist does get to walk away, but they've lost time. Yeah. And in the music industry, like your sweet spot, you've got like 18 to 24. And after that, you're kind of fucked in rap. So if if you stay with a label from 18 to 24 and they're not doing the right things and they're not they're not building your career. Now, all of a sudden you're 27 and they let you go like you're your prime years are gone. So yes, they lost money, but it's kind of easy to make money. You can't get time back. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, I don't mean to sit here and bash on the major labels because I actually like the major labels. I think that they have a purpose. And I think that once you have leverage and you're a priority inside of the label, I think they're awesome. I think some of the best people work for major labels. I think somebody like Drake and Rihanna would not be as successful as they are today had they stayed independent. So I don't want to just sit here and bash labels. I'm really bashing the underlying concept and business model of signing 108 people and then two of them become successful. That's what I'm bashing. I'm bashing artists that don't do this on their own and learn how it works and then sign to a label and sit back and say, okay, wake me when I'm famous. That's crazy to me because you're probably going to have to keep working in order to get to a point where success starts to happen, the label notices, and then they get behind you and help help you get all the way. That's really more the scenario of success in the music business when you're signed to a label. Do you think a label could be successful without signing as many artists? Not the indie label, but especially on a major level label scale. Yes and no. Um, they need pipeline because they're, they're, they're beholden to investors and stockholders. So it's a little bit of a different model. Right. Um, I think this would be a much better world if labels signed less artists and focused on what they had. So I look at the, the labels like loud, which was super popular in the nineties. Right. And, and they had some artists that didn't succeed as well, but for the most part, their win ratio was incredible and they made a lot of money doing what they were doing. The artists made money doing what they were doing. You know, I was talking to Steve Rifkin a couple weeks ago and he asked me, you know, Wendy, why did you never start a label? And I'm like, cause I was never willing to do the one thing that I had to do to be successful, which was own a piece of somebody's publishing. And he said to me, Wendy, I never owned an artist publishing. He's like, we never did that out loud. And I was like, say word. He's like, yeah. Like, mm. why would I do that? That's their art form. So I'm like, wow. So I had this total misconception for the past three decades <laughs> that in order to be successful as a label, you had to take a piece of ownership in the publishing. But when you look at the dollars and cents, if Steve had signed less successful artists and less artists that couldn't get to the level that they got to, he would have had to have taken a piece of the publishing in order to make money. To make it make sense. Yeah. Yes, to make yeah. it make financial sense. Like all of the investors that come to me and sign artists, they have to own a piece of the publishing in order, like in the very beginning, for them to be able to invest a quarter million dollars into this artist they have to have some ownership, but as they start to make their money back and once they break even, now they need to renegotiate because they should not be a 50-50 partner once that artist is starting to make great money. They should, there. it should be more of a sliding scale. Like the artist should now make a bigger part of the profit because the artist is doing more work and the money is less valuable to get them to the next level. So you're a big fan of deals constantly being renegotiated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I get it for as an advocate for the artist, but, you know, you see all these convers um, conversations. Um, the last one that was super public was the Meg Thee Stallion one. Mm -hmm. At least that's the one I could think of, right? So, again, you go back to the logic of I put money into this person to make money back, right? Now that we have just gotten you popping, 
now all of a sudden the re- renegotiation happens. I don't know the ins and outs of that situation, but I'm assuming he probably didn't make his money back yet. I'm thinking maybe. I don't know. I'm guessing. I, right? I, I don't know enough about this to right. speak on it, so just, but I'm guessing that there's a reason he's bucking. Right. So I'm like, if we just think about a framework, because I think artists and the way, their leverage, I feel like, in terms of popularity can happen before the actual money is there. Right. So you're like, Hey, I'm doing, I'm here now and everything is because of me. But right. it's like, if I haven't made my money back, cause popping, you can pop so fast and become yes. so relevant so fast. Yes. It's like, all right, well let the money catch up first. Yes. Right. So if we think from a technical standpoint, um, do you think transparency would help with that? Cause we have no transparency. I think if you and I are in business together, yeah. right. And we all know what everybody's making and you haven't made your money back. I'm going to be very cognizant of that. And I'm going to want you to make money. I don't want to be the only one getting wealthy and vice versa. If you guys are making all of the money and I'm not, I could see where you might be a little uncomfortable because it's like, wow, Wendy's our partner. We want her to be able to, you know, pay her mortgage and eat and, you know, put, put gas or electric in her car. Right. So I think if, if, there's a line of communication and it's a little bit more transparent. And I also think that at the very beginning, if people are more aware of how this works and what it looks like, like when you listen to Megan talk about her side of this, she talks about how she didn't know anything when she signed her contract. Why is that? Mm, Why the fuck didn't she know anything? I don't know about y'all, but I've been making videos for 30 years about how this shit works. <laughs> I wrote a book. Like, yeah. it's very hard to feel sorry for somebody in 2023 that doesn't understand how the music industry works. Yeah. Because the information is out there. If I could learn it, anybody could learn it. I'm not yeah. smarter than anybody. How did you learn it? Because you're talking about, yeah, Yo, I'm smarter I, I, than I, everybody. I, that's <laughs> how. <laughs> that's I came in the game negotiating deals for... The cash money and people I, I like that. I didn't come the into the industry okay. negotiating deals. Okay, I came yeah. into the industry pulling people out of bad deals. I mean, so that's, that's I was actually seeing, what I meant to say. Okay. How do I come in a game and pull somebody out of the bad deal if I haven't been in the game previously? Right. You know what I mean? Here's like, what I did. What process? I, I can't through? tell you how to do it today. I yeah. did it 30 years ago and it was yeah. different. So what I did was I aligned myself with really powerful attorneys that were making a lot of money in the music industry. And I appealed to their altruistic side. Most people that are in this, they see like how fucked up it is and they want to fix it. They want things better, especially for artists because they're human. Artists are people, right? So I would go to attorneys that didn't necessarily care about making money and ask them, hey, could you just look over this contract and see what you think? And they would look it over and be like, okay, this is this is bad, this is bad, this is horrendous, this needs to come out. And because they had relationships with the heads of the record labels, the major labels, they would call and say, hey, can we rene- renegotiate this? Or, hey, how do you feel about so-and-so? You know, and it's like, oh, they're not really making me any money and I've got these other three artists that, that I'm focusing on and they're not really our priority. Great. Can, can you release them? Yeah, sure. I don't, I don't want to hold anybody back. So we were able to get releases based on attorneys and their relationships and just doing what was right. And then I never, ever, 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 ever did a press conference saying, yeah, we just pulled so-and-so off a Def Jam because I didn't want to be like, I wanted it to be quiet. I wanted it to be efficient. But I also realized that once somebody got dropped from their label, it was even harder to get another deal. So it's like, okay, great. I got you out of a bad situation with the help of this amazing lawyer. Thank you very much. But now what? You know, a lot of the guys that I was helping were going to, to school to become EMS workers, but they wanted to rap. But they were going and getting job jobs. They were working for FedEx. They were working for UPS. And for me, that was heartbreaking. So I learned very quickly from seeing all these bad deals what a good deal was. And then because I was so outspoken about um, 
about what I was doing with artists, so many artists were very kind and shared their contracts with the artists that were in great deals. You know, E40 was really supportive in the beginning. Too Short was supportive in the beginning. So when I was doing Twista's deal, there were guys in their camp that were saying, okay, Wendy, you're about to go do this deal for Twista. Here's our deal. You know, we get a million dollars every time we deliver a record. So then I went in saying, huh, okay, I want a million dollars for him every time he delivers a record. And I knew they couldn't say we don't do that because I knew they had two artists signed that they were already doing that with, Mm -hmm. you know, and then other labels would step in and say, okay, um, I know you're talking to this other label. We want in. What, what, what do we need to do? Oh, well, we're at a million dollar advance. What are you offering? Oh, we'll give you 1.5. Okay, great. You know what? They want half the publishing. If you don't take, If you don't take half the publishing, we'll go with you. And that's how we were able to get better deals because the artist had so much going on in their region already. And then the labels had a feeding frenzy and they were just one upping each other. So we were able to get the better deal out of the label that made the most sense. And by the way, all labels are not equal. If you're an artist that says, I just want to sign to a record label, you're a fucking idiot because they're all different. They're all good at different things. Some are good at social media. Some are good at street promotion. Some are good at radio. Some are great at pop. Some suck at at street rap. Some suck at commercial rap. So you've got to go where that team can actually benefit you, where they can add value to what you already do. If you're a street rapper and you go to a label that's all about radio, you're going to be miserable because they're going to try to fit you into their cookie cutter mold and you're not going to fit. And it's just going to be a really bad experience for everybody. So you have to go where it makes logical sense and where the staff can actually work you and help you get ahead. I always say if you look at the competency of the team, it'll tell you a lot because most people yes. aren't there are those rare people that are like hey i learned all this stuff this is my my bag but i i want to now learn more things i'm managing this artist i want to take yes. on new things and really become holistic there are those rarer people but most people it's like if i know the publishing world i want to figure out how i flip this artist specifically for the publishing exactly world. how do i specifically run him through this this chitlin circuit that i know exactly. like whatever i know i'm just trying to monetize right and i don't have a vision beyond that and i've seen and been in meetings with artists who might um, who might be becoming a client or something. You hear the one, way one is talking and the other one's talking. Like, and oh, they she don't, want, she they wants don't match. To be a superstar. Yeah, he just wants her to write some songs. Yes. and keep moving. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes, so it's, <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's something that people really should be cognizant. They of. have to. Yeah. You know, the first thing I ask anybody that I sit down with is, "What's your goal?" Oh. And it doesn't mean your goal can't change. It just means. I'm like GPS. I need to know where you want to be to get you there, to give you directions. If if you come and you say, I don't know what I want, how can I get you to the destination? If we're sitting here right now and we decide we want to drive to Chicago, we can get there. Mm -hmm. But if we're just sitting here saying, I don't know where I want to go. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Let's just stop for food along the way. We're never going to get anywhere because we're going to go in circles and bump into each other. Oh, it's nothing to it's worse. not gonna yeah it's not gonna work relationship like what are we gonna eat tonight i don't know what you want i don't know what do you want to eat what? <laughs> dear god yes exactly or yeah. in a relationship and your goal is to build the best sneaker collection in the world and your partner's goal is to have a real estate empire so you're spending money not to say that you ever would i'm just making an example but you're spending money (laughs) and she's saving money trying to flip so your goals are complete opposite you're never going to be happy you're always going to just be fighting about money because you've got different end end games you know yeah yeah I know you said you had something specific. I I wish I had known that when I first started dating. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because I used to date people because they were intelligent and I like them, Mm. you know? And then I got into relationships with people that had completely different goals than I had. Like my goal was never really to to build a family. It just wasn't something that was important to me. Not that I wouldn't have done it, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't a priority for me. So 
the, I remember dating this one guy who's like, I want six kids. And I'm like, oh, this is not going to work. <laughs> like I, I could pump out one, maybe two, but six, mm -mm, mm -mm, that is so not me. Yeah. So you've got to be like-minded and it's the same in the music industry. You've got to have a goal that your team shares. And most importantly, most importantly, most importantly, they can get you there. Because if your goal is to become a superstar like Drake or Rihanna, but they don't know how to get you there, how's that going to happen? Because you're signing a contract with them. They're going to be with you for five to seven, possibly 10 years. It's not going to happen by magic. How are you going to get to the level that you're trying to get to if they don't know how to get you there? It's a little scary. I mean, people get lucky, you know. A lot of people get lucky. People get lucky, and they have a manager who grows with them, but most of the time, when they get to the top, they have completely different teams around them, and I think that's why. The ones that keep the same team are the ones that early on said, this is my goal, and sometimes goals change. You know, if your goal is to become like a mid-level artist – but you have a hit record and now you could become the next tw Taylor Swift. Why wouldn't you, you know? Yeah. Well, so goals can like change. I've seen that happen too, though, where the manager's like, why wouldn't you? This is it. And the artist is kind of like, nah, I'm exactly. cool where I am. Exactly. Yeah. That's where communication mm -hmm. comes in. Because if you want to manage Taylor Swift and your artist isn't, isn't that big, you're always going to be frustrated. You're, you're going to feel cheated. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel like, man, we're not successful, but you're a multimillionaire. And if that's how you measure stuff, then you are successful in your own terms. You know, yeah. it's all in how you measure it. It's in what's important to you. Yeah. One thing that, that I found really interesting about your, your content when I first discovered you was how, real you were about the money conversation, right? And I think you were one of the first pe uh, people I ever heard put like a price yes. on breaking an artist yes. and it was 250, 200. Yeah. Can you break down that number? Absolutely. So it's it's actually, that's what we charge, um, but it's actually 150,000 in marketing and promotion if, if you're not hiring us. Um, I noticed early on in my career that so many people would have like 10 grand or 15 grand and then somebody in the industry would come and help them and say, oh, for five grand a month, I can help you. And the artist would would be like on the hamster wheel and they would spend all their money and they might grow a little bit or not grow at all. Mm -hmm. But the person that got paid got paid and then moved on. So there were people that were just in the music industry hitting a lick. And you realize after a while, it's not working, you know? And there comes a point where you have to say, which matters more, helping an artist become successful or just making money every month? Mm -hmm. And if you're somebody that really wants people to be successful, you're going to do the research to find out, okay, why is my business model not working? Like, why am I making $5,000 a month from 10 different artists, but none of them are getting to the next level? And I think that when you really look in and you study it, you see that it really takes a lot of money to do this. This is not a free industry. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy industry and it's not free. And it's one of those industries where you can't be on the outside looking in and figure out how to do it. Like I can't just watch what you're doing and figure it out. I can't watch Beyonce and say, oh, I'm going to do everything she does and I'll be successful because she's already successful. So I saw early on that I didn't want to just make enough money to pay my rent. That would have been lovely, but I wanted the success. I wanted the wins. And I saw what it was taking for the artists to win, the artists who were winning. I saw what it was taking for them to win. And I emulated what they were doing, the artists that were new and getting discovered and blowing up. So I realized how much money it was taking. So rather than trick somebody that doesn't have enough money into hiring me so that I can pay my rent or my mortgage, I was just always up front and said, okay, you don't have enough money to succeed in doing this. So you have a choice. You can either go make more money and then come back and do this, or you can find another investor to come in with you so that you have enough money or 
you can just move forward and spend that and see if I'm wrong. And there's so many people in this industry just spinning their wheels and spending money and not getting anywhere that for me, that's heartbreaking because it makes it look like music isn't successful. It makes it look like music is a huge risk. And while it's risky, I don't want to say that it's not. It's not as risky as it looks when you really know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. our win rate is insane. So it's not, it, it's not. I'm not in this to make money. I get paid what for what I do and I get paid really well. I don't want you to think I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I'm not driven by the money. I'm driven by the success. If I can't say this artist makes enough money to live and feed his family, if the investor doesn't make their investment back and some return on their investment, I feel like a failure. I don't care if I can pay my mortgage and my car payment at that point. Because I'm not successful. If the artist isn't winning and that's why they came to me, then I lost. Yeah. And I what, don't want to lose. What you're describing is like when NBA players talk about those guys who don't love the game versus especially the people who are the, like the greats who, hey, I'm winning. I'm making all this money, but I still want to win. I want another championship. I want to go versus the guys yes. who... I'm making good money. And, I'm living life, but I don't really care too much about it. And winning. I'm talking about the guys that are playing well and they come off the court and they go spend three hours in the gym taking shots mm -hmm. because they want to be better at what they do. Yeah. That's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people that want to be the best at what they do and are willing to put in the time and effort. And in this industry, if you study it, you can see what it takes to win. It's not rocket science. Like what we do isn't really that hard. We're not curing cancer. We're not doing brain surgery. It's just we do more of what works and less of what doesn't, right? We market and promote. And when you figure out all the steps that you want to take and then you price them out, there's your budget. You can yeah. figure out what this costs. So if you put together a list of everything you want to do that you need to be successful and you add it up and it comes to $150,000 and you've got 10 grand, you've got a problem and you've got a problem I can't solve because you see what it's going to take, but you're thinking that somehow you're going to go into it with less and magically it will work. It's like starting a restaurant and you can afford the, the building, but you can't afford the food. Or maybe you can afford some of the food. So you have a menu with 30 things on the menu, but really you can only make eggs and grilled cheese because you can only afford to buy some of it. You're not going to be a successful restaurant because people aren't able to eat what they want to eat in your restaurant. You're only serving two things. So it's kind of that philosophy, like figure out what it takes to, to win and then figure out how to get it and then do what's necessary to win. Don't come into this not knowing or understanding how it works and just, oh, I hope I'm successful. I, I hope this song takes off. I hope I win the lottery. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. Like the odds of winning are millions and millions and millions to one. But if you learn how it works you can do what you need to do to succeed. Yeah. And I know what we've seen too on the agency side is oddly enough, like the ones that want it bad enough figure out how to get, get yeah. money, right? Like there'll be yeah. a lot of them who get turned off by the number and it kind of discourages them. But we've seen people come to us and say, hey, I have $2,000. Well, we think you need at least 100K to do this. And they come back like a year later. Like, yeah, because they figured it out. It out. Yeah. 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 I would take that too and I would... I would pay somebody to do a business plan for me. And then I would go out and find investors. And I've always got clients and I've always had clients for 31 years now. So there are investors out there. Artists come to me with their investors. Sometimes I have two clients in a year. Sometimes I have seven. So there are people out there finding investors. It's not impossible. Mm -hmm. So why not you? Why not you? Yeah. Uh, another question I was kind of wondering about too, because you mentioned right, it's two hundred and fifty k to break if you want to work with us. One hundred fifty k in marketing that means that your fee is a hundred. It's a hundred. Yes, 100K, yes. Absolutely. So what does it 
what does it look like building up to a hundred K retainer in the music industry? Like, like what were kind of the steps or I guess what was the point in your career where you realized like, Hey, I could charge this, this much money for what I'm doing. It's funny. I started out charging 60 grand and <laughs> I came to that price because I sat down with so many people that said, man, I just lost 60 grand. I need you. You have to show me what to do. So I'm like 60 grand. I could make 60 grand and you wouldn't lose anything. So that's how I started my price. And then I started building my reputation. And when I had too many clients, I raised it to 80. I stayed at 80 for 14 years or 15 years. Cause I'm not really driven by the money. I'm driven by the success, as I mentioned. And then I raised it to a hundred just a couple of years ago because I started getting too many clients at, at 80. Mm. So I raised it to a hundred. And it's funny because when people first come to me, they say, damn, why do you charge so much? Cause it feels like a lot of money. Mm. And then when they start working with us, they get about maybe five, six months in and they look at me and say, why don't you charge more? And it's <laughs> funny, the difference the time makes. It's like, you know, when I'm working with somebody, I stay with them for as long as it takes. So it could be anywhere from a year and a half to four years. I was in trouble four and a half years, mm. you know? So a hundred thousand divided by four and a half years, I would have made more money as a Walmart greeter, all kidding aside. But if, if I have a client that pops off in a year and a half and really is doing all the right stuff and people are gravitating towards their music, then yeah, that's a win for me because I can live on that. And now I have a staff. There's six of us now out here doing this. Six of us. How long do you want to do this? 10 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, in a way, I'm not kidding. I, I really want to build an incubator. I, I've noticed that, and I've noticed this my whole career, that sometimes people with money don't have talent and people with the talent don't have money. Mm -hmm. And that's always frustrated me. And my clients are all supremely talented. Like I don't take on a client that I don't feel we can win with, right? Because I want, I want the win. But I turn down a lot of people. And I feel badly because it's like, I can't win. And I know you're going to go off and you're going to hire somebody else and somebody else is going to make money, but you're probably not going to be successful because you don't have what it takes. And it breaks my heart a little bit every time I have to tell somebody I'm going to pass, you know, because I feel like, I, I feel like maybe I should tell them, Hey, you're not going to make it. But I don't feel like I have the right to do that because what if three days from now they go and make a hit record and they blow up and they become a superstar? Mm -hmm. Like who the hell am I to tell somebody that, right? right? So all I can say is that they're not right for me at this moment. I can't add value. And if I can't add value, I don't want to be part of the team. So if, if someone is coming to me and they're depending on me to get them to that next level and I can't do it, I just feel like I, I shouldn't, but then there's so many people that have 20 grand, 50 grand, and they could really win. And I know they could win if they just had the right budget, but that for some reason they can't find an investor, either they're not good at it or they don't know where to look, or they're not willing to do that kind of work because they just want to make music. I want to help those guys. So I want to be able to invest in them, have our company invest in them, help them get to the next level while they're inside of the incubator for two or three years, however long it takes, we can share the money based on who's putting up what percentage. And then once they leave, I want them to leave with the ownership of their publishing and their masters. And I'm having difficulty finding an investor to fund this because they want ownership. So if I'm willing to take ownership of, you know, 6% or 10% or 20% so that when they leave, we still have ownership I can find investors all day, but I can't find the person who thinks like I think and wants to see them leave and go on their way with 100% ownership of their own music and art form. I was going to ask so that's you why, why right that hasn't happened yet because, you know, you've had this idea for a minute. I have. You know, so. I have. And, and then your credibility. 2016 like, was the first business plan for this, and that was a while ago. The, the ownership, <laughs> and I found bro. many investors. It's just they wanted, you know, VC firms 
they only want to be in this for five years and you know how long it takes to break an artist. Mm -hmm. So if my minimum is two to three years, I can't cycle through very many people and to cycle them through for the VC to make money, they want something, they want to retain like 6% ownership after the artists leave. And I don't want that. How do you make it make sense for, let's say I'm an investor. It makes sense on paper. Right. Well, I'm, all right. So yeah. let's, let's do Without it, right? the ownership. So Go ahead. If I'm, a, if I'm an investor, mm -hmm. all right, let's just say my initial thing might be, all right, not only when, if I invest money, not being my, the altruistic side of me. I yeah, just, forget, if I, if forget I'm, that. If I'm investing money. Surely an investor. Right. The whole thing is to maximize upside. Yes. Right? So we finally get something win to win. Yes. It's hard enough to make something to win. And now I'm minimizing and creating a ceiling for the upside. I get Correct. On the one thing that I just put all this energy Correct. into. into making so win. what if we choose more artists that would win? Cause we all kind of know what's going to win. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. My win ratio is pretty good. Yeah. So we know what's going to win. We see the, the music that fans gravitate towards. We see the work ethic that the artist has. We see the team that they have. We know that if we give them a hundred K cause they already have 50, we know they're going to get to the next level. So why don't we, why don't we work with more of them and less of the ones that don't really have a chance and, the investor still makes money because on paper they can, they can triple their money. They can quadruple their money in, in, in the incubator. But what's happening is they're looking at the numbers and they're saying, okay, yeah, we can make 500% return, but look, we could make 700% return. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, why isn't 500% enough? Like, why does it have to be more? Why isn't, where else are you going to go and make five times your fucking money in three years? Mm -hmm. So why does it have to be seven times? You know, why can't we just do what's right, build this company and let them go on and, and sing our praises and then more next generation artists want to work with us because these artists are out here saying, I made money. I have ownership. I'm 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 loving this this incubator that I came from mm -hmm. rather than saying, "Man, I hate my fucking label. I didn't make any money. I hate my fucking label. They took ownership when they didn't have to." And by the way, there's a ton of artists out here that would happily give up ownership. I they would happily say, "Wendy, I'll give you 50% of everything. Make me famous." Oh, it's crazy. You know? Before we were in a position where like it was make it made sense to offer us that type of thing. People exactly. Were like, "Yo, man, can I just not to have to pay your fee. Can I just offer you ownership? <laughs> Isn't that like, crazy? Uh, no, but, but they like, don't realize, out. they don't realize like <laughs> just one thing is not enough. Yeah. So now they've given up 50% for mm -hmm. one thing and there's seven other things they have to do. Yep, exactly. So what are you going to give up to get those other six or seven things? Mm -hmm. There's not enough percentages of ownership for everybody. What's the difference between an incubator and the, in a label? Like your incubator. Um, an incubator teaches artists how to do this. A label does it for you. A label wants to retain their secret sauce and not tell anybody like really who they're hiring or what they're spending or, or who the priority is. Whereas an incubator is teaching the artist to be self-sufficient. They're, they're teaching them to fish instead of feeding them. And it's not really an incubator. It's really... Um, incubator is just a word I use. It's really an accelerator, right? Yeah. Because I want artists that are already doing something like they need to have some skin in the game and they need to have right, some right, movement. Right, 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 right. So it's really an accelerator. accelerator but when yeah. I say that in our world, people are like, Oh, you mean like an incubator? Yeah. Yes. An incubator. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I call yeah. it an incubator, but it's not really, but yes, right. it, it's teaching them so that they can go and sign this person and, and do right by them and then sign that person and do right by them. Or even bring them into the incubator, you know, if they want to. But it's, I'm trying to build more successful, independent, and do-it-yourself artists. That's my goal. I like that. I don't believe you need a major label in this era to be successful. It sounds like what we do on, on a way more official level, like the... Like a true, like you said, accelerator with the traditional tech infrastructure and yes. everything. 
Yes. That would be amazing. Yes. And we put them out on the road and we, you know, because remember I said there's the digital side and then you have to go like kiss babies and shake hands and, you know. You think about like old school artist development too? Yes. That's an aspect of it? Yes. That'd be cool. Yes. If you look at all of the movements in music that have been successful they've come out of people working together atlanta i'm going to use it as an example because we're sitting here right so gucci man had a studio back in the day right not far from here right and out of that studio came young thug came the migos mm-hmm. came kind of everybody right yeah. mm-hmm. and that that circle of people working together is what incubated the success of atlanta right. let's look at memphis Same thing happened in Memphis. There was a guy that worked for Universal Records and he had access to studio time for free and he let 3-6 Mafia come in. He let all of the the up-and-coming artists use use Universal Studios for free. You know, after the rock artists and and the blues artists were done using it, they would come in and use it in the off hours, but it became a hub. It became like an incubator, if you will. Mm-hmm. So they all came up together. They all knew each other. They were doing songs together. Um, this guy's producer was producing for that person. That guy's producer was p- producing for that person. They became like a, a, a network, mm-hmm. if you will, right? A family almost. Yeah. And if you look at New York, it was the same bad boy. In L.A., it was the same. Like they came out of um, of pods of people that all kind of worked together. Well, that's kind of what I want to build. I want to build a system where everybody comes together and they all share resources and they come up with each other. So as you're beginning to feel success, so is he, so is she, you're all feeding off of each other. You're all helping each other. Hey, I'm going out on tour. You've got a great market. I could really benefit from your market. You could benefit from mine. Let's go on a tour together. Okay. We, we've known each other for years. Let's go. What I like about your version of it understanding enough about it just from the tech side where i come and seeing these is it builds leverage over time yes can continue to be successful where these pods right like another pod barry gordy and all yes of them, right? motown, motown. Like yeah the great the pod probably in, the best pod ever right the the difference is it's even though it's these pods are created these people individuals are all still in the business yes so they go on and do what they set out to do. Yes. And it was a moment in time. And then there has to be another yes. pod that gets created. Exactly. Where your model is your thing it's regen- is the pod, It's, it's right? regenerating. Yeah, the pod is regenerating. Yeah, the pod, is the pod doesn't go away. So you the pod stays. Yes. And make it. Uh, and the staff, powerful. the great thing about um, any of these pods is not only does great talent come out of it, but great team staff, mm-hmm. like um, great yes. management, great engineers great you know um i'm drawing a blank but publicists like you get it like promoters like i want the teams to be regenerating at all times i want people to graduate and go on both artists and workers you know i want everybody to excel and get to the next level and it works on paper like i can make this work on paper it's just a matter of finding somebody that has the vision to enact it and not say, no, I want to own a record label and I, I need ownership of everything because unless I'm making a hundred million dollars instead of 50 million, it's not worthwhile. Y'all give Wendy the money, man. Give her the money. <laughs> I love that. I love that, man. It's, we, and we, you know, I'm coming to get you when the money comes, right? You know, you already know what's going to happen. Do, please do. We, you know, we, it's coming. Cause we like have done these things in multiple, in, in, in our own way, right? Like we were training marketers, music marketers specifically, yeah. like, because, so you talk about the professionals and I real and even in that process, you realize that, yeah, there are these people who have the talent, yes. but they don't have the ability or p- place to cut their teeth because they can't Correct. find artists that are good enough to know if you're doing bad enough. If you only exactly. can find bad artists or you can't find somebody. And you think budget, it's you. Right? You're working with a bunch of bad artists. You think, oh, my way doesn't work. No, right. your way works beautifully. You're just using on the wrong type of artist. Exactly. It takes an environment for yes. you to even test yourself out in this industry. Yes. So much of the talent is spread out. Like I, I, would, yes. I would always say. It's like, okay, especially marketing, right? You can spend a thousand dollar budget, right? And the skill set can take you but so much up to so here, far, right? right? 
you're never once you get there, you're not going to be able to increase your skills and, and insight. Not without more money. Yeah. Ten thousand dollars. Exactly. See what that looks like. Exactly. And, and then 20 work, and right? then 50 and then 100. Yes. That. But if you don't have that access or you're not, attached you just to you hit the ceiling. And then the worst part is you don't stay there. You decline. Yep. And if you stop when you start again, it's like starting at zero. It's yeah. like starting over. You yeah. can't you can't be dormant for three months or six months in this industry. It's like starting back over. You know, it's the consistency that builds success. What do you think about the impact of content? I know the the prices have been the prices, right? You talk about the 150K. Was it more expensive back then? Or, or it's, it's always been, been. It's always been about 150K. Yes. Even adjusted it's just, for inflation. Yes, yes, so, which is weird. So probably has gotten cheaper because so of inflation. So maybe right? that's where the content yeah, kind of, kept it at 150K. Yeah. Instead we of spend, making it cheaper. We spend most it. money on content. The bulk of that it's budget still, is right? content. Yeah. Yes, yeah. content is king right it. now. Like it really matters. And I'm even going to take it a step further and really depress artists. And they hate when I say this, but songs and music videos are content. Like Mm, everything today is is content. And I realize it's art and I really respect the art, but your art is content. It's content. And it's up to you how good the content is. It is. Every, everything is content. Like you don't yes. have to abide by the stigma of how other people do it. Mm-mm. Just do yours. In Just a do you way. and put it out and see what's reacting. Like learn how the data and the research work because every platform you have now has data. So you can see, mm-hmm. Oh, it works better when I put out stuff with a purple background than yellow. Okay. Do more of what works and less of what doesn't. It's really that easy. Test your stuff, put it out. If something's not working, stop doing it. Do something else. Like test stuff, do do different stuff. You know, talk about different topics. Talk about different topics in different environments and see what works. If if it works better when you're on a playground than when you're sitting in your car, be outside on a playground. Don't be in your car. Do what works. Look at the numbers. Look at the research. Look at what's reacting and do more of that. If you're making songs that are happy and songs that are sad and the happy songs are going further, do more happy songs. If the sad songs are going further, then that's your your niche. Do the sad songs. Everybody's different. I can't tell you, oh, everybody makes sad songs because that works. Sad songs work when that's your image and that's what you are bringing to the world. Do what works for you and do more of it and test stuff and look at the research, look at the data, figure out who your fans are. Don't just, don't just hit everybody. Not everybody is a fan. Find out who your fan base is and target them specifically. And I think that's the hardest part for most artists because they're not, savvy about who their fan base is they don't they don't know and even if they look at the 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 data like the fans on soundcloud might be different than their fans on tiktok right yeah. you know and they don't realize that you can have more than one fan base it's okay at some point you're going to get big enough where it's all going to blend together it's all going to become the same i want to do a quick rundown just of a couple of, Ooh, I love rundowns. of Wendy's post. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you have a lot of interesting posts. You know what's funny? I'm telling you to like check the data and I don't on mine. Like I could care <laughs> less what works, especially on my Instagram. Like I do not give a fuck. I'll see something really cool and I'll post it. Like the, there's a young kid dancing. That's one of my last posts. I have no idea how many people liked it. I have no idea how many comments are on it. But for me... Because I'm not, I'm not an artist. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to drum up business. I don't have to run my social media the way I'm telling you to right. run yours. Right. But enough. please go down, go down. Yeah. I want to start with this one. Okay. You what did you got? A post. Uh, you shared the post from somewhere. To be be fair, from Illuminate. Music is an emotional art. Knowing what moods drive fans to listen and the causes they care about can help artists form deeper bonds with their fan base. You remember this post? Yes. All right. So then it goes top U.S. music listening moods. 64% are happy. Yes. All right. This is post-COVID, by the way. 
post COVID. Yes, uh, so this is right after. This is right. Yeah, this is context because we were all so fucked up by COVID that when we were coming out of COVID, we wanted happy, happy, happy. Give me happy, give me happy. Mm. So keep going. All right, fifty-one percent um, of people really liked calm. So that's yes, basically the other part of yes, that, right? Yes. And mental illness is huge right now. Like that, yeah. that as a topic, yeah. like we really care about mental illness. Yeah. So calm yeah. kind of fits that. But keep going. Fun is 49%. Energetic is 49%. Nostalgic Another post-COVID. is 38%. And people yeah. forget. Yeah. yeah. Go back to the good times. Yes. Whatever yes. that might be for and, you. And some attachment. Like um, I told you driving over here, I was listening to rap from the 90s. Mm-hmm. And it put me right in the frame of mind that I was in back in the 90s, Mm -hmm. which for me was fun. It was at the height of my career and I was having a good time and doing deals and life was great. And (laughs) you know what I mean? Like I was in that inner circle. Now there is no inner circle. It's so fragmented that Mm. I can never go back to that. There won't be that. Right. You know? Right. So there's a lot like nostalgia is important. Yeah. Yeah. You can use that energy to. Tap into that old energy too. Yes. Like, let me get back in my bag. Let me put, yes. put a, you know, yes. try to create the scene that was exactly. around at that time. Exactly. Yeah. Plus our happiest memories, you know, like when you had your child or mm. your prom or your wedding. It's like songs anchor. They take you right back to, and, and it works in the opposite too. Like a song that you heard, um, I smashed my BMW to throw some D's on it. So every time I hear that song, <laughs> I remember what it felt like to for the airbag to explode in my face, right? right. Music right. anchors to good and bad moments. When choice. I hear this song, I go, huh. Ah. Every time I hear Waka Flocka, Waka Flocka Hard in the Paint, I think about falling through the floor. Oh, Jesus. Every God. single time. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, more? yeah, more yeah. house, house party, interesting time. Yeah. Well, I've one, heard this story. That was going wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see the video. Oh, okay. I was there. Like, <laughs> yeah. okay. <All> right. <laughs> I, it was, uh, but yeah, nah, yeah, that was, I was up in there. It was a long, interesting night. Great story though. You know, college, you know, you know, was, you told me the day I met you, that was a great story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go into detail here. I have forgotten about that. <laughs> I love that you mentioned it though. Cause I've forgotten about that. You sure did. Focused is 30%. That's interesting. Lo-fi hip hop. Yeah. Focused, so you have play music when you study. Mm-hmm. Which remember, the fans are thirteen to twenty six. Mm-hmm. So from thirteen to twenty two, most people are in school, right? Mm-hmm. College, high school, middle school. What do you do when you study? You play music that's calming and serene yeah. and helps you to focus. Low high, low fi, low fi hip hop or instrumentals or or, stuff, or whatever. You feel like gashes you up. Yeah, and I think that's just interesting because you wouldn't have expected that to be high or people don't even think about that as a category one right and for that to be as high as it is because it's over content which is interesting i would like to know what that is um and then sad being 23 percent, and which is funny we have so much emo rap exactly oh my god yes there's so much being pushed out there yes. you would think it's so much bigger than it is right and i wonder how that dissidence can happen where people are thinking this is the thing let's create more in that and you even see more artists because i know talking about people who be a part of social causes and don't really care i see a lot of artists doing sad rap because they feel like it's working exactly more than and even exactly. but they'll tell you i really care about this thing i want to touch people's heart but really they saw how somebody like x or juice world connected with people yes right? because they were sad right because they because were it was that, they were fucked up style, exactly right so maybe if they knew, hey, this wasn't as big right, right. <laughs> as, you know, right. as you think it is. Because the reality <laughs> is artists are not checking the stats to see what's working and what's not. Mm. You know, they're just making music because they feel like it's them. But it's what they're it's what they're surrounded by. That's your bubble. It's your bubble. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so. if everybody in your bubble is eating Percocets and they're sad and down, you think the world is sad and down. Well, now you know, artists, if you really want to get the bag and you're just choosing what you create just for the bag, sad is not the way to go. <laughs> sad right? is not happy. It. Most people want to be happy. Yes. And that's also going to probably extend beyond the bubbles, which is probably why yes. the number so big. Yes. OK, now let's th- look at these other topics on here. I would like to know. Your, let me see. It says causes that fans care about. Hip hop fans care most about. Number one, mental health. Mental health. Number two, mm-hmm. racial justice. Mm-hmm. 
Number three, homelessness and poverty. Yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Rock and country. And that's mostly Gen X. That's this generation, right? Generation X. Okay. It's mostly Gen X. Rock and country fans both care most about one, mental health, two, animal welfare. Right. You know, I'm not a rock and country fan. I just never would have imagined that that to be on this list. And number three, homelessness and poverty. All right. Well, you would expect it to be on the list. Think of all the memes you've seen talking about um, if white folks see a black man get beat by a cop, they don't really react. But if they see a dog getting beaten, like the world ends. Think about those memes. I'm aware. Yeah. That's that. Yeah. But man. See, and the number form is different. Yeah, and in relation to the <laughs> yes. music and the fan. That and part. this is um, Luminate's end of the year study. So this is from January of 2023, which means the research was done September to December ish, like in the fourth quarter. Okay. of. So it's not that long ago. Mm-hmm. This is interesting. Okay. And then Latin fans care most about number one, mental health. So that's the thing across the board, which I look, man, I'm. I'm a little skeptic because I'm like such a marketer. I'm like, man, y'all have been marketing mental health to people. I feel like a little bit is being exploited. At the, uh, well, that's a whole nother. I'm right thing. with you. You know what I mean? I'm right with you. Um, number two, homelessness and poverty. And then number three, which is also a surprising one, climate change. Hmm. That surprises me too. And here's what's especially interesting about this is Latin music and country music are the fastest growing music right now. You said Latin, which Latin and country are the two fastest growing. And then world comes in third growing world, like K-pop, Afropop. The amount of success that that music is getting streamed worldwide, the amount of money. um, I don't know if this is worldwide. It's illuminate. It might not be. Okay. But stream specifically though. Yes. It it. might, it might be just in the U S okay. But Latin and country are growing the most of all the genres. Got it. It doesn't mean they're the biggest. It means that they're growing fastest right now. Mm. Mm. And just to add this clarity, because someone asked you to elaborate, uh, I'll just read what you said, because someone asked, um, what do the percentages represent? You said knowing what moods drive fans to listen. So 64% of the fans listen to music when they are happy. 23% of the fans listen to music when they are sad. And seek out that mood right and yeah. seek out that mood. yes you said you're one of those people yeah i am but you're seeking it out to be cheered up so you're listening to it when you're sad too but you're listening to feel to, better but well, that's not true sometimes i listen to sad music when i'm sad because i want to cry and get it out of my system okay explain I that to, to me yeah i want to hear and that, that might be a female I, I, thing I, I never get that yeah that might be that's a female crazy. thing there's a lot like, of there's a lot of no there's a lot of guys who do the same thing i'm not yeah. i'm not somebody who's comfortable crying like i was raised that you know don't cry or i'll give you something to cry about <laughs> yeah. so we were taught not to have emotion as mm. as kids so sometimes when I'm sad, in order to get it out of my system, I'll listen to, like if somebody breaks up with me, I'll listen to love songs where, you know, she was done wrong and life sucks and oh my God. And I'll be like, oh, that's so sad. Like a sad movie, right? Like, oh, that's so sad. And then I'll feel better. Like after I get it out of my system, then it's like, oh, I feel much better. Okay, let me, let me go walk my dog. Let me go, you know, do whatever in life. And you do the same thing. Yeah, bro. What you? That's what I'm saying. You don't do it. No, that's crazy, bro. You ain't never just wanted to sit in your emotions with the music, man. No, and I get in fights with it. Well, you all about it all the time. You, you might, you might be very in touch. You may not have grown up the way that I grew up. You know, where you're, you, you're in touch with your emotions. Where when I was growing up, like. I can't cry in public. I get embarrassed as fuck. If I'm in the movie theater and I start crying, I like hide my face. Like it's terrible. (laughs) It's terrible to cry in public. My logic is like, if I feel this way and I don't want to feel this way, I don't want to consume something that's going to make me feel more like. So you listen to the opposite. And, and Mm -hmm. also in fairness, like I'm a really happy person. I think you've probably noticed. Mm -hmm. So you know how like, the algorithm in social media gives us more of what we already believe. Mm -hmm. So I see happy stuff all day. Like some of my friends will be like, um, man, did you see the news? Like this person died and this disease and that. And I'm like, 
I don't see any of that because it's not what yeah. I consume. Right, right, right. So I have to actually seek it out. Like if I'm looking for something negative, I have to go find it. It's not going to be fed to me. All right. Yeah. I, 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 I'm. So maybe you're there, more balanced because yeah. maybe you are seeing good and bad in your algorithm. Maybe it's yeah. getting fed to I'm you. Pretty balanced. But I, I guess I also have been like, like I'm one of, also one of those people where it's, like I won't watch like really demented movies and things like that, but I feel like if you people who do that, I don't know, they're like escaping into that to imagine right. that stuff. But me, right. I'm like, it's really already crazy enough up in here anyway. <laughs> so I'm trying to minimize that for real. Because then I've, right. I've consumed that stuff and like, because my imagination is like crazy. Right. So I'm like, because you're I creative, like shit bland around me. Right. Because because you're already out. You're already yeah, out there. Yeah. Because like, I get it. it, it I get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I it, I was watching a uh, a series on I don't know Netflix or whatever, and it's called Gangs of London, and it's just gratuitous violence, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was watching it, and one of my friends said to me, "Oh my God, this is so violent." I'm like, "It is." I hadn't Good. really noticed it because I'm so desensitized to it. <laughs> to me, it was just like I was laughing at it. It was yeah. like, man, nobody's going to hang somebody up a building like that. But that's funny. Oh, look, he lit him on fire and he, he <laughs> burned down the rope and they fell 50 stories. Oh, that sucks. I, my reaction to it is different than most people where they're like a gas, like, oh, my God. Right. It's like I can separate. <laughs> so maybe maybe that's you. Like you don't need to watch that stuff because in your head it's already there. Not not violence, but like you said, like it, it's like quirky stuff, right? Maybe quirky might work. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're so creative that it's already there, so you don't have to watch it. And even if you watched it, it might not be as good as what's already in your head. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about the. I'm freestyling. Thing, like the watching, but yeah, I think it, I'm making this it up. Definitely is a, 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 a I some of the idea of like I don't need new material because. Right, my mind will take it so far and do weird things with it already. Right, and it's like I try to, and, I, and that's kind of a thing in my, in my family. My my dad is like a hyper creative dude. Or okay, so you and come by it honest. It's in yeah. your DNA. And if you look a, around yeah. him, he's like, well, yeah, that's, he's a whole nother story. I'm not even that's funny. That. But he's a hyper creative dude. So, so did you did you <laughs> notice? Not trying to change the subject, but did you notice in what you were just reading that it's not about genre? It's about, even though you were talking mm-hmm. about the different genres, it's almost like playlists, like mm-hmm. happy, sad, yep. energetic, focus. There is no more genre. You know, a, a happy playlist might have a happy rock song, an EDM song, and a rap song all in a row. And that's normal today. I think that's... It's genre bending. I think it's always kind of been that way. And now we're just seeing it? Yes, exactly. I love that. Because I love that the the fact the way we did things before the idea of genres was just an I, a way to organize things. Well, it right? came from radio, didn't right? it? Exactly. Like it was just radio formats. Right. You listen to rock, or you listen to country, right. or you listen to EDM and or dance sense, or whatever. Right? Because yeah. you want to play things that you are more likely to. We like. want to keep like you there to sell keep, ads and, and keep you there, right? Yeah. Exactly. And how do I categorize this? We're always as humans going to look to to judge stuff, right? But then the when you create your personal CDs, right? When, when people do slow jam CDs, right? They're pulling a specific mood. Like we, or when we're at events, right? If we're at a cookout, we're playing a certain mood. We're at a club, we're playing a certain mood. That's always been that way. But I think now because of the lack of physical, Mm -hmm. right? You have the ability to do that without the, the opportunity cost of having to buy another CD or buy right. another record. So it just right. makes it easier for us to do right. what we wanted to do in the first place, you know? Right. But I don't think you, you can get away from ever like calling it a genre name, at least from a formal business standpoint. I feel like there's a place for it. Yeah. The I, labels are fighting it. Yeah. Cause I, they like the boxes. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm a person who, as much as I don't like boxes, no labels. Right. But I also understand them as a tool. So my thing is your use labels as a tool, but don't allow them to define you right. personally. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's the balance because the tool is, all right, if I don't have forever to talk to you and you're like trying to figure out what I do, uh, I'm a music marketer. Right. Right. And I might tell somebody else, you know, 
something completely different, but it's something that fits what I need them to know about exactly. me at the time, right? So that's just exactly. the communication of it. But then me, I always think of myself as more than that. And I think you that's what artists kind of have yeah. to get used to, right? It's yes. like, all right, over here, there's a function of why I'm doing this. But on the other end, all right, I still know I might want to create way more different music. And, exactly. And there's a different way to go about it. But I don't want to get you know too deep in that and, and how I think about it. I want to ask you one more thing to, sure. to get your opinion on. Because you, I know you have strong thoughts on this. You know that Universal Music sued over its Spotify. No, they, they wrote it wrong. All right. Universal Music was sued over its Spotify equity ownership in the class action lawsuit by Black Sheep. Right. Mm -hmm. One. Speak a little on black sheet before okay. you talk about your opinion, because a lot of people don't know a black sheet. I'm not even super adept to black sheet. I, I, I know yeah. of them. Right? They were they were signed to Mercury Records mm -hmm. in the 90s. Um, they're like a mid level rap group. Mm -hmm. They were successful. They had uh, a couple of hit records. Um, they their trajectory. I mean, they're still popular. I don't want to imply that nobody's listening to them, but they were they're, the the height of their career was probably like a five to seven year span. Cause that's kind of what you get as a rapper. Right. Yeah. So what they found was that their deal, they didn't think was very fair. And it probably was not at that point in time, just because of the time that they came up and um, universal invested into Spotify and then sold their shares. And they want to understand why they didn't get a share of the return on investment since it was their money, not just their money, but uh, you know, a lot of artists money that made the investment. Mm -hmm. That was their feeling like, well, where's our share of that? You get a share of everything we do. Where's our share of what you did? Um, it's still in the court system. I'm still watching it. I think it's really interesting what they're doing. A lot of artists jumped on that with them, which I love. It became a class action suit, and I'm anxious to see what comes from that. I can't really speak on it one way or another because I don't know the financials of the investment that went into it. I don't know where that money came from. Do you think a big artist would ever support that? I hope that they would. Mm. Yeah. I hope that like Taylor Swift or Drake or Rihanna – joined it. I don't, I don't know if they have or not, but I could see where somebody with a bigger share of the pie would have way more weight in the decision than smaller artists that have less weight. Right. Yeah. I would think logically that makes sense. I don't know. I'm freestyling again. <laughs> <laughs> Jacore, you have any questions for Wendy before we, we hop on out of here? Nah, man, she answered everything for me. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for Thanks having for me. By. I really love that you're doing this. Like you're helping so many people by doing this. I just, I love you guys. I appreciate yeah, that. Thank you. I appreciate definitely it. Definitely love you too. One of my favorite people in the industry. Same here. And I you know, really love you. One of the gliding light lights when things get dark. I'm like, all right, Wendy's Come on. going over there. You know, Come moving. On. Things look good. Yep. Yeah, I remember when you were teetering and you weren't sure that you were still going to do this. I'm like, dude, you got to. You've got the man. you've got the fan base. You got to keep going. I don't know, y'all don't know, man. <laughs> I was on the go, go, go. Doing fan other base. things, man. I could have just been a fan. I wanted to uh, hop back into the Matrix. I know you, you did. know what I mean. It's like, oh, all this but you stuff. always can. This is you ugly. always can. This like, is ugly. I just want to be a fan and not know all the behind the scenes. Yeah, and shit. sometimes it's ugly. I know. <laughs> I know. It's hard. Uh, but we here. And Lesson: now. Don't meet your heroes. It can be really depressing. All right, now I believe it. That's literally my one goal. Like, don't meet any of them. That, that, he, he says that constantly. Yeah, all the time. I do yeah, not want to. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because you just don't know. They could really be a douchebag. You just, you never know. You just never know. They're yeah. people. And people are people are people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Don't blame the entities. Don't blame the no. titles. Don't blame the economic system. People suck. That's what it is. Uh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we are out of here. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Yes. Yeah, this is, I love doing this. Yet another episode of No Labels Necessary podcast. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.